A quick internet search for headlines on parenting provides us with a deluge of descriptions of parents not capable of bringing up their own kids without an array of assistance and advice from government and experts. Increased surveillance and criticism of parents has surrounded families in a toxic atmosphere of suspicion. But what has brought on this obsession with parenting? And should we accept that policymakers and super nannies know more about our children than we do? I decided to speak to Jenny Bristow, mum and writer, to find out. Today you have um, a focus on the problem of parents not caring enough parents not being intensive enough, um, as sociologists describe it, in terms of their uh, parenting habits. And you have a kind of fairly concerted drive to get parents to become more and more obsessed with everything that their child is doing at any point uh, during the day. And that's really the way I describe it. I don't think it's a kind of a conscious process. I think it's a kind of sense of anxiety about the problems in society and a bit, a bit of a loss as to what else to do with them. So you focus on parents and you tell them to kind of change their behaviour. Just how intense is the public focus on parenting? I decided to ask Jane Sanderman and Alison Small, who set up a parents forum, what they thought. I hate the way that you sometimes, you know, I find myself standing back and thinking about what you do in your home, in your yeah. own private space, and kind of thinking, but it, it just that all those very natural things that happen at home, you know, oh, am I playing enough board games with my children, you know, or, mm. or whatever it is, and you're just like, well, you know, actually, that that's ridiculous that we can't just have that natural kind of, you know, what goes, goes. It's your house, you shut the door and you get on with it. On Friday, I went to my daughter's assembly, and the, you start off, you know, lovely, all the parents come to assembly, the deputy head, headmaster stands up and goes, you can't take videos, you can take a photo of your child, but only not anyone else's child. Um, you obviously can't put them on the website because of paedophiles. So, you, you, so you, even if you take a photo of your child, you're not then allowed to um, put the picture wherever you want it. Oh, and then bizarrely, he said, and we're going to take a video and it will be in our, our school area and you can access it so we just think well that the whole of that is irrational if you think we you know access to websites when we're putting pictures of our children into paedophile rings and actually why are you uh why does your film be more sacrosanct but the point is it's just making arbitrary rules because you can yeah. and you think we're all sitting there accepting it yeah. when it's the whole thing's illogical and nonsense and you just, and you just think that's increasingly we're treated like idiots and it's just like anyone can make any rules and tell us what to do just for that now how did this come about why can't parents be trusted to parent anymore one of the big things that's really shifted over the past 20 years is that um, family policy has gone from being something that was implicit in british policy to explicit Mm. So that um, previously the, the family was sort of taken for granted. Now, parenting policy has become much more explicit and you get a real sense that civil servants sit around actually writing down a, in you know, official documents, this is how you should bring up your children. It's become um, such an obsession within the, the public world, which I think does really kind of risk destabilising um, parents and their own kind of sense of confidence in bringing up their children and the sense that what they're doing is something that they've got responsibility for and auton autonomy over. I've heard that schools are checking kids' lunch boxes and sending letters home if the lunch isn't good enough. So, you know, parents are so stupid and guilty, they're not even capable of feeding their children properly. Like you said, it's no longer implicit, ex explicit. You should do this. If you don't do this, you're a bad mother. Well, there's two things that have happened. First of all, the... the um, uh, preoccupation with child abuse has absolutely skyrocketed. And when you look at it, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, really, because it's not like child abuse is a new problem. Forms of behaviour that used to be kind of part and parcel of family life have now been redefined mm. as um, abuse. So smacking is the best example of this. What used to be seen as a discipline method, amongst others, is now that is a form of child abuse, and there's various attempts made to 
bringing legislation to outlaw parents' ability to do that. And I think this is interesting. I think what it represents is a, a shift in the child protection model mm. away from a, a approach that basically sought to identify demonstrable harm and intervene on that towards um, a sense where what you're supposed to be doing is producing the optimal child. Yeah. This is how you get from assumption of abuse that is really about you know, beating children or doing terrible things to them to this idea that a child is being somehow abused or neglected if you put a chocolate bar in their lunchbox mm. or um, you know, if, you, if you fail to smile at them enough times a day or if you fail to read them a bedtime story. And I think that is really kind of what's problematic because what, what we're dealing with here is a sort of sense of um, this idea that children are like machines that you, know, you just put the right things in and you get the right things out. That's not true. Uh, and it really does impact on parents' confidence and, and sense of joy about their families. If, if there's this sort of constant raft of, raft of behave, everyday behaviours which is deemed to be problematic. Any time a parent sort of thinks, all right, I'll give my child some oven chips, you know, that, that's what they like, and, you know, I'm fed up of trying to feed them broccoli. That is, oh, my God, what am I doing? You know, I know really they sh I should be stuffing them with five fruit and veg a day, and, and I'm not. So I think that undermines any mother, and which is, you know, 99% of um, mothers will not um, breastfeed to six months, which is the World Health Organization recommendation. So 99% of mothers will be formula feeding their bottle in, in a child in some way, um, you, you know, in, in that time, and will be feeling guilty. Oh my God, what am I doing? I am not breastfeeding my child. And, you know, many mothers will not every day, you know, be too tired to give their 15 minute read to their child. And again, oh my goodness. And in, insignificant decisions take on a significance that they just, you know, doesn't be out of proportion to the thing. So that, yeah, the oven chips becomes a, you know, oh my gosh, like Jane said, what have I done? And I, you know, who cares? You know, television is another example, isn't it? So uh, that idea that, oh, my goodness, children shouldn't watch television or only, you know, if they watch more than one hour of television a day, their brains will be fried and they'll, you know, become sort of morons. But again, that, you know, for most, particularly with toddlers, most parents' experience will be like, oh, God, you know, I've got to get on the house work or catch half an hour's snooze and I'll put them in front of a, the television. For, and, and every time they do that, it's like... Yeah. I really, I feel guilty, I really shouldn't have done that, I really wish I hadn't done that. So you just think, you know, that's a perpetual... Yeah. I mean, none, none of it's scientifically proven at the end of it, of course. But, but what about neurologists and experts who claim that if parents don't follow the prescribed parenting rules, they are damaging their children for life? I don't say anything to neuroscientists because I don't really think the discussion is coming from neuroscience. I think it's coming from policy. I think where it comes from is, a, a, again, a, a long-running theme in discussions about um, the family, which is sort of determinism and biologism. I mean, the biggest kind of, well, the, the most notorious manifestation of it in the 20th century was eugenics, this idea that you can breed better families through you know, controlling people's reproductive choices. I see it very much in, in that light, this is sort of idea that you can somehow nurture in mm. um, better neuron development. Because it's all, I mean, it's bonkers, this stuff, if you read it. I mean, it's just utterly nuts. There's this sort of idea that a child, up until three, um, after three you've had it, but up until three, a child's got all these kind of free-floating neurons that need to be fused in the right way, according to the precise number of cuddles you give them, or stories you read to them, or... But I think it's worrying that it's become so influential now in policy documents and the policymakers think nothing of producing documents with a sort of healthy brain and then a shriveled <laughs> brain of an abused child as though this is supposed to tell us something. I mean, it doesn't tell us anything. What used to be moral arguments about how you bring up children and why you should do what you do um, are now presented in scientific terms, which has the effect of closing down the debate. Um, and I think that's a, you know, I, I think that's very cowardly. I think if policymakers think that, you know, for example, women should breastfeed their children for six months because they, yeah, you know, that makes them better mothers. They should say that. I don't agree with that assertion, but I think they should say it. But they don't say that. They say they should breastfeed their children for six months because it uh, makes their brains bigger or better, you know, which is both wrong and um, and very kind of cowardly in terms of ducking the argument. I think as modern families, we do rely on experts in some areas of our life, you know, or rather professionals. 
I think what's happened now, though, is that you've had this sort of cult of expertise, yeah. 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 which is not about um, saying there are particular people or groups or professions who are good at specific things, but it's more about saying parents don't know what they're doing in any respect about anything, and they've always got to defer to somebody else for guidance. And if you look at who the experts seem to be, you know, they're people on the telly, you know, you got these super nannies and all of that, newspaper columnists, you know, who are often kind of experts just by dint of the fact that they've got children themselves or that they've got a view about people who've got children. They're politicians. I mean, what do politicians know about bringing up children? Well, they might. Individual politicians might know a great deal about bringing up children. But as a group, you know, politicians don't know anything about bringing up children. And I think what this really indicates is that this isn't a response to parents' need for expert advice about specific things. It's a, a re real sense of just parents are just generally incompetent and they need to constantly have their judgment checked. I think it's a sort of a mass confidence problem in our ability to sort of take responsibility for our own family lives. The more we're told, I guess, that you're useless, there is an element that parents do believe they're useless and they look to experts. So it's, a, it's almost like a vicious circle. So there's more, the more there's sort of policies around you can't do this, you should have parenting classes, you are rubbish, you should, uh, you need some experts, you need someone to tell you how to discipline your children. Actually, that yeah. does become a truth when that does happen. So I think you can see the discipline thing. People love that super nanny thing, don't they? And it is, and everyone's borrowed this thing, the, the naughty step. I don't know how to um, discipline my child. I must watch super nanny, or I must obey a book around how to discipline my child. So. It, so I guess there is a relationship when it, it, you can't just say, oh, it's just authorities and we're brilliant. Yeah. We sort of do give it up as well, don't we? We, we? we accept the publicity sometimes and think, oh, no, we aren't very adequate and we do need Super Nanny to tell us how to um, tell off our children. No, I think, that, I think that's right. And, the, and there's sort of, I think, some, sometimes, I, um, particularly mothers, I think, but sort of really relish that oh, this is such a hard job, I don't know how to do it, it's really difficult, you know. Um, we, and I think that, you know, that shouldn't be the case, actually, that it, that it, you know, we should be able to trust our instincts and talk to our friends and our mothers and our, you know, grandmothers or whatever, as has always been when a woman has a baby and has never done it before, of course, then you, you know, you talk to other people and work out what the best thing is, but I don't think those networks are trusted either, particularly now. Mm. So it is like, well, you know... I'm rubbish, I'm terrible, it's so difficult, I've never done this before, it's also such a hard thing. And then I think, that, you know, the, the, the parent or the role of the mother becomes, you know, I think women are sometimes really escalating that into a job that then becomes something that is the hardest thing yeah. that a woman can ever do, um, instead of it being able to be something much less difficult. But it is difficult for all of the reasons that we've just talked about, which... Okay. Um, you know, because because we don't trust ourselves. To a certain extent, there is that level of. Well, I don't whether you, you did, it didn't even used to be called experts, was it? It was a sort of seen as a healthcare information. So there was a level of information, and I think that yeah. is useful. Um, but I think increasingly, it's changing what expert-led advice, which isn't about you know information, then you can make up your own mind. Is now we will tell you what to do, and you don't know what to do. And then I think that's a very different. Um, situation and then and I just that is not useful I think that's true I think if there were a range of of um, options mm -hmm. then that would also be different but I, but it isn't like that even when they pretend there's a range of options even when um, you're told that you do have a choice actually you don't so mm -hmm. um, my example was around um, it was about giving birth which was ridiculous that's that's when it started and being told you know, as a mother, you have um, a, you get to do a birthing plan where mm. you choose what kind of a birth you want. So um, I didn't do one, and the midwife was saying, "Well, you need to do a plan." And I said, "Well, okay, I want a pain-free birth, um, so I'd <laughs> like the option of whatever drugs I need at the time." And I can't tell you what that might be because I'm not doing it. So that's it. And she said, "Well, actually, that is not an option." Because that's pes that's too um, pessimistic. You need to be more optimistic. You need to be more positive. That is not the option. So he, that's what I mean. Even when you're told you do have a choice, mm -hmm. you don't really have a choice. But and I think 
you know, the, the, the Jane's point that it is very prescriptive now, I think, what you're told, this is the way that you have to do it. So, you know, if there were a range of people giving you information at points when you needed it and not when you don't need mm. it, then that would be different, but that isn't what it is. Jenny also believes that the endless stream of needless advice should stop, as she argues in her book, Standing Up to Super Nanny. What I was trying to get at in that um, title was, um, not that I've got a real problem with um, Joe Frost on the telly, um, or that I think, you know, Super Nanny has that much of an impact in terms of um, how people really bring up their children. But was that sense of the fact that um, people do these days seem to want more and more parenting advice and more and more kind of quasi expertise mm. um, and be prepared to take that from all sources even if they know it's not real you know I mean Super Nanny yeah. the TV show as is, is, we know it's, um, it's edited highlights of terrible behaviour and miraculous recovery it, it can't be real we know this and yet it's sort of watched and promoted as sort of reality TV mm. and so what I was trying to really um, get at was not the there was that the obsession with parenting and parent blaming isn't just a policy problem. I mean, policymakers do it, and it is problematic that they do it, but it's it's also a kind of cultural phenomenon. We seem to have just become a kind of quite neurotic about our ability to do very kind of basic things with child rearing, and rather too disposed to looking elsewhere for um, you know affirmation really of our of of what we do in our everyday lives. So. Yes, the, I mean, the argument in, in the book was about saying let's kind of just chill out a bit and recognise that, yeah, actually the person is not political. You know, what we do with our children is because we love them and that's, yeah, this is, this is our everyday life. Mm. Uh, that is very different to what we might want to do and say um, out there in society.